morning. I didn't read about Samuel as a boy working in the temple, but um, we used the psalm for the morning and also the gospel for the morning. The first Sunday of Christmas, gospel is always about Jesus as a child. We don't have many stories of Jesus as a child, do we? So one year it's Simeon and Anna going when Mary takes Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple for the purification rite when he's eight days old, followed by the escape to Egypt, which is part of that story. Nope, that's the next year. This, the escape to Egypt, complete with the slaughter of the innocents. And if you think you want to just preach on something that's going to get people roused up for Christmas, talk about Herod's order to kill all these babies. Now, in the scriptures that we have, the words that we heard this morning that Jesus speaks to his parents, his earthly father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary, are the first time we hear him speak in scripture. But there are other gospels that were not included in the canon of scripture. One is called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Now, if you believe the horror movies, they said that the Vatican puts out a hit squad on anybody trying to protect these old texts from being read in public. No, I read them 37, 38 years ago in seminary. And you can go online and download it if you want to. I'm going to read you the beginning of the infancy gospel of Thomas. When the boy Jesus was five years old, he was playing at the ford of a rushing stream. And he gathered the disturbed water into pools and made them pure and excellent, commanding them by the character of his word alone and not by means of a deed. Then taking soft clay from the mud, he formed 12 sparrows. It was the Sabbath when he did these things. And many children were with him. And a certain Jew, seeing the boy Jesus with other children doing these things, went to his father Joseph, and falsely accused the boy Jesus, saying that on the Sabbath he made clay, which is not lawful, and fashioned twelve sparrows. And Joseph came and rebuked him, saying, Why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? But Jesus, clapping his hands, commanded the birds with a shout in front of everyone, and said, Go, take flight, and remember me, living ones. And the sparrows, taking flight, went away squawking. Quite the story, huh? Jesus is five years old, makes little mud pies, mud birds, claps his hands, they fly away. Now, this is not included in the canon of scripture. Not necessarily because it's not true. Now, there are people who say this is a heretical teaching, a heresy. Heresy means a partial truth. But if you look at the formation of scripture, you know why we have four gospels? Because Irenaeus, one of the church fathers, said because there are four winds, we will have four gospels. These are not inspired words. And I think they were not included in scripture, maybe not necessarily because something like this never happened when Jesus was a boy, but because they don't add anything to the believers who follow him to encourage the faithfulness of his followers. Because you have to remember when scripture was written down, it was a time when the church was being persecuted and they wanted stories that would sort of bolster everybody's faith up. It's very interesting. If you read through the Gospel of Thomas, the infancy narrative of Thomas, actually, because there's a separate Gospel of Thomas, If you get to the end, it has exactly the story we read today from the second chapter of Luke, Jesus the boy in the temple. So maybe the bird part isn't necessarily true. It's sort of like George Washington. You know he never cut down a cherry tree, right? That was made up by one of his biographers who happened to be a pastor who thought, we need a really good story to show that he was like that when he was a kid. And so he made up the story, freely admitted he made it up, and people still say, I cannot tell a lie, Father. I was the one who took my hatchet and... Now, why his father gave a six-year-old a hatchet, I don't know that either, but that's for another day. But here we have the first words spoken by Jesus when he answers his parents when they're looking for him. Let's look at what's happening in this story. We find out that, actually, we found out in the story about their purification with Simeon and Anna in the temple that they were poor because they only brought the gifts of very poor people. That's also included in this gospel. They, they had the gift of two turtle doves because they could not afford the gift of a lamb or any sort of animal for sacrifice. We also know that they're faithful because these are poor people who made the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem to the temple for the Passover celebration, which was an incredible journey, which is why it took them so long to discover that their son was missing. Because it was not just you know family getting in the car and driving or getting on the plane and flying in. They had to walk a great distance, and they had a great entourage of folks. So when they realize he's not with them, they look for his cousins. They look for his family and his friends, and they go to everyone. They can't find him, and then they go all the way back to Jerusalem. It takes them three days to find him. That's when we realize what he's doing at the age of 12 is accepting the faith he's been taught. 
as he comes to the cusp of adulthood. Bar mitzvahs happen at 13 when boys are considered to be adults in the Jewish faith. Today, still, that's when bar mitzvahs happen, but Jesus is coming to his own in his faith, accepting what he has been taught. Now, maybe he seems a little snarky to you, because what does he say when his mother says, boy, we've been looking all over for you, we've been worried sick. Anybody ever say words like that to your child? Do you ever find a child that had wandered off in the store or something and you don't know whether to hug him or smack him real hard? That's what Mary sort of says, isn't it? Where have you been? Well, how could you do this to us? We're worried. And Jesus says, don't you know where you should have looked for me from the beginning in my father's house? Again, an indication that he has an idea that Joseph is his earthly father, but he has a father in heaven, and he has a destiny given to him by that father. Now, I worked on this sermon and put this bulletin together a couple weeks back, trying to get everything ready before the office closed, so... I went yesterday while everybody else was doing some Christmassy things. I was working on a sermon. Yay, fun. And I remembered talking to a good friend of mine about this passage because that's what pastors do sometimes. We discuss with other folks, trying to get deeper insight. So when you study the Bible with friends, when you study the Bible with a group at your church, you'll get more out of it than just by reading it. If you don't believe me, try it sometime. Come to a Bible study. You will learn things and think things you never thought. So my friend had given me a great insight into this passage, and I could not for the life of me remember it yesterday. So I sent him a little message and said, if you have a moment in the morning, could you sort of remind me what you said? He wrote this beautiful passage. It's so eloquent. I wrote back and said, can I read it and give it you attribution? He said, sure. So this is my friend Wayne Hipley, who works for the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Um, he works in parish renewal. He said, I think when we hear the story of the boy Jesus preaching in the temple, we often automatically assume that the reason everyone that listened was so astonished is because he was speaking as a learned adult, even more theologically learned than any of the elders that heard him that day. As we hear time and again in Scripture, those were the leaders of the community of faith, often layered upon the truth unnecessary ideas, often their own, or such strict adherence to the law, rules and regulations. Their concept of what it means to be of the people of faith had become overcomplicated. There was so much focus on behavior that they lost touch with the heart of their faith. As an adult, Jesus spoke of the importance of having faith like a child, a faith that was pure, that was trusting, that was humble, that was wholly reliant on God, a faith that was simple but not simplistic. I believe those are the great truths that Jesus taught in the temple of the boy. What astonished and enraptured the elders was not his advanced theological prowess, but his ability to succinctly express what the heart of the message of God was, to shine a light into their murky ideas of faith and see how they should truly live as disciples. When Jesus is retrieved by his anxious parents, I imagine a scene where the others in the temple become even more astonished because to them he is revealed as the child of simple parents, poor people, and not as a rabbi in training of some great religious figure. Jesus confidently walks away almost glowing to the eye as he leaves dead silence behind in the temple. I think that's a good way to look at this story, that what Jesus spoke to was beyond the law, beyond their expectations, beyond their hoi polloi faith, that they sort of imposed on other people. And he got to the heart of the matter that God's love for us is so intensely dramatic that nothing can get in its way. He spoke simple words of faith and trust and hope and devotion to his God. When I was younger in the ministry, one of my congregations had a large sanctuary with a very large chancel area. We were raising money for the Appalachian Service Project, and then the next year we went to Jamaica. And so we were building houses, and that's what we wanted to remind people of. So during the season of Lent, we built a house in the chancel. The chair of my trustees in those days had a construction company, and he was going to build it and take it apart and use it as the playhouse for his kids later on. We built the house in the chancel over the weeks of Lent. People got to see it go from a pile of lumber to a beautiful little home. Now, the first Sunday... I made everybody so mad they can still hear the sounds of hammers and nails. They didn't hammer during prayers. They didn't hammer during the sermon or the reading of scripture, but during the songs and everything else, they hammered and hammered and hammered. Oh, people had a fit. They walked out. They called their congressman. They called their bishop. They went nuts. How could you do such a horrible thing? After that, the house went up during the week, and they got to come in and see it. But you know what happened the last Sunday? 
when the house was complete and the kids went in, there was a little guy there, Kevin. Kevin was five then. Kevin has spent his entire life in a wheelchair. He's now in his 30s. But Kevin was sitting there, and we pushed him. We had a little ramp into the house, pushed him inside the house, and he looked out the window, and I said, why would I do anything so crazy as build a house in the church? And the adults sat in the congregation going, huh, we want to hear the answer to this. And Kevin said, because we need to remember all the time that everybody on the planet needs a house to live in. Because you know what happens when you ask a little kid, if somebody's hungry, what do you do? What do they say? You feed them. If they don't have any clothes, what do you do? You get them some clothes. If they don't have a coat in wintertime, what do you do? You say to a kid, what do you do? They'll say you buy them a coat or you give them your coat. But you know what always gets me the most? If somebody doesn't have a house to live in, what do you do? You know what most kids say to me when I ask them that question? You invite them home to live with you. That's the faith of a child there. How many of you would answer, invite them home to live with you? Probably not, because that would mean we'd have to do that, wouldn't it? It'd be a little hard to do, a little dangerous. We'd think of all the reasons we shouldn't do it, like the reasons we shouldn't build a house in a chancel and hammer. But there's a holy sound to hammer, and Jesus himself worked in the trade of his earthly father, Joseph, as a carpenter. He knew how to use a hammer and nails. Now, I called this sermon like a kid in a candy store. Because that's Jesus in the temple, isn't it? You know what that expression means, like a kid in a candy store? It doesn't mean you go in and go wild. The definition of this says, it's feeling as though all of one's wishes are coming true feeling as though one has everything in life, feeling that one is extremely fortunate to be in such a situation, delighted because of the wonderful situation one is in, extremely happy because of all the good things that are happening. That's what people need to feel when they come into the church. We need to wake up and say, oh, thank you, Lord, it's Sunday, not, oh, Lord, it's Sunday. We need to make the church a place where children are comfortable, where they feel blessed. Now, that doesn't mean we do everything that the world would say is what you do to attract children. I had someone leave one of my congregations once. She went to a church that had a bouncy castle. Every Sunday they had a bouncy castle, and after Sunday school, if the kids were good, they got to go bounce in the castle. And I said, if I have to get a bouncy castle to get kids to come to church, I'm going to leave the ministry then. It's not about that, but it's about making church accessible to children, making church a place where they feel comfortable and welcome. If they squawk or cry or fuss or run around a little bit, we don't give them the stink eye, as we like to say. I have been in churches where people have been told to tell their children to sit down and shut up. It's one of the reasons I want to develop this 930 service with a different kind of music that speaks to younger people. Now, I know that lots of people love traditional hymns, and I grew up singing them, and I love them myself. But if we only sing 19th century hymns, we've cut out a couple of centuries of people being, being given the word of God in song. I'm never going to tell anybody, I'm sorry, your song has no place here. The song that God has given you, that you've given words to, that you've given music to, because we like the old stuff here better. And I hear all the time, I get some emails that say, you know, you sing too many of these new songs and we just don't like them. Well, sorry about that. We're going to spend some money here in a couple weeks. We're going to order some little robes that look like mine. I couldn't put mine on this morning because I was just a little too tired today. We're going to order some albs and some candle lighters, and we're going to have some acolytes because we're going to get kids involved in worshiping God publicly. We're going to do some things a little differently because I want every child who comes into these walls to know that they have a place here. I want them to feel like a kid in a candy shop where they find that they have everything they need being given to them here, love, grace, acceptance, the stories of their Savior, Jesus Christ. It's up to us to teach them they are loved and welcome and adored by us as they are adored by our Lord who adores us all. So I hope you'll be with me in the new year. Now I was thinking about the acolytes and I remember the same church where I met my friend Kevin who now is a devout Christian. He works with young adults in Frederick and he's quickly becoming just a regular adult, not even a young adult anymore, and proclaims Christ all over Facebook and he Sometimes will come and see me in a church. I don't know if he's been here yet, but he always tracks me down eventually. I was his pastor when he was five, but he was an incredible person of faith then and is an incredible person of faith now because it was nurtured in him as a child. Now, he wanted to be an acolyte, but the chancel was inaccessible. 
The pastor I worked with then said, it would cost so much money to do that. He can do something else. But you know what the church said? No, if Kevin wants to be an acolyte, we're going to put in a ramp for him. And they put in a ramp. It took him so long to light those candles, but he got them lit. And you know, my first Sunday there, I was sitting there looking at the congregation I was about to serve for the first time. And you know who came down the aisle? The acolyte. And it was a girl. And I thought, wow, I've never seen a girl acolyte before in my life. And I thought, they've never seen a girl pastor, so we're probably even. What we need to do is to encourage children, not just the ones who are born into this congregation. We need to go out into the world. We need to reach out to our preschool families and get them involved in the congregation as best we can. Because if we are not nurturing the next generation of the faithful, who will? We have God's love in abundance. We have faith in abundance. We need to share it in abundance so that everyone who comes in here feels like they have hit the jackpot. I hope you feel like a kid in a candy store sometimes when you come here. I hope your heart is lightened when you're here in worship with those we love, with those we've known so well. But always, always make room in the pew for who comes after you so that we can share the faith that we've been given These are the first words spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture that we have as canonized Scripture, what we believe is the inspired Word of God. He says, didn't you know where to look for me? Didn't you know where I would be? I would be in my Father's house. He is here, and it's time for us to take him into the world and to bring others in with us the next time we come. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. I invite you now as you're able to stand and sing. Hymn number 179, Sing a Song of Bethlehem.